Thank you all for being here. That is such a great crowd to welcome Janet Napolitano. I want to first thank the Clinton School uh, for having me here, but for inviting the secretary here. This is her second time to Arkansas. I'm sure she'll tell you about that in a few moments. But I also want to really thank uh, the Clinton School for the wonderful students, the wonderful faculty, the staff, and all of the guests that are here tonight as guests of the Clinton School. One, one thing that we know firsthand here in Arkansas is everyone at the Clinton School is committed to making a difference. And uh, let's give our new students in the Clinton School a hand. Uh, are some of them here tonight? All, all y'all stand up. All the new students stand up. Come on, stand up. Let's give them a hand. Thank you. And welcome to Arkansas. For many of you, I uh, want to say a great welcome to Arkansas. And uh, let, me, let me say this, that the Department of Homeland Security is really a creation that came out of 9-11, as most of you all recall. Uh, back then, there were 22 different agencies and many other offices that dealt with national security issues that, that, that touched, that had functions touching on our homeland security. And uh, it really, when they put it together, it was one of the largest reorganiz governmental reorganizations in our history. And at the time, the department was very, very focused on terrorist attacks, and, and understandably so. But I think that one of the things that we now know is that because they were so focused in the early days on terrorist attacks and terrorism, they maybe neglected some of the other challenges that face Homeland Security. And from my standpoint, in my personal opinion, it became a little unbalanced in its focus. And I think we saw that very clearly with Hurricane Katrina. When we looked at the response to Katrina, you know, quite frankly, we weren't ready. The Department of Homeland Security wasn't ready. Uh, FEMA wasn't ready. And we saw that day after day, week after week, month out after month play out. In fact, we saw thousands of uh, trailers and mobile homes at the Hope Airport as a, as a legacy uh, statement of that. But um, what, one of the things we learned after all that is that this department requires a very strong leader, and we have one in Secretary Napolitano. I first met her when I was elected to be your Attorney General in 1998. Uh, we started a, uh, I, I went to my first Attorney General orientation and the first person I sat next to, of course, Arkansas and Arizona, I'm going to sit right next to her, is Janet Napolitano. By the time I had met Janet, she was already a very accomplished Arizonan. She had uh, uh, been the valedictorian of her class uh, her, in, in college. She had worked as a, um, as a law clerk for the U.S. Court of Appeals, the Ninth Circuit. She had already been uh, the U.S. attorney in her state, and she was destined in just a few years to be governor, and that's where she and Governor Beebe became such close friends. Um, one of the lessons that, again, we learned after Katrina is that we can't be focused on just one thing. We have to have a Department of Homeland Security that, that can look at a lot of different things at the same time, and we've learned our lessons here from the lone wolf shooting of the, of the two Army soldiers at the recruiting station out in West Little Rock. Uh, of course, we learned that lesson after Oklahoma City. But, but what Secretary Napolitano brings to the table is an all-hazards, very flexible, learn-from-experience approach. And I'm going to tell you, she's a breath, a breath of fresh air in Washington. Uh, public service is something that she takes very seriously, and I bet if she was honest with you today, she would tell you that sometimes in her job the fun factor is way down here, but it's a very important job, and we all depend on what Homeland Security does. We all rely on their excellence, and I'm going to tell you, it is an excellent department under her leadership, and I know that uh, her remarks today will shed some new light on the uh, value of civic engagement in today's society. So it is my distinct honor to welcome my friend and colleague, Secretary Napolitano,
to share her insights on public service. Let's give her a hand. Well, thank you. Thank you, Senator Pryor, for that introduction. And it is a pleasure to be back in Little Rock, and it's an honor to be asked to give this address uh, this evening. And I intend to speak for a little bit, and then we'll have some uh, Q&A, which I always find to be the most exciting and thrill-producing part of most uh, presentations. Um, and uh, let me also uh, say that it is a special thrill uh, to be here at the Clinton School, uh, which is beginning its seventh academic year. Uh, it is named, of course, uh, for our 42nd president, uh, someone whom I greatly respect for his service to this state, um, to our country, and indeed now to the entire world. Now, President Clinton, as did President Kennedy, understood the power of public service as a tool for bringing people, ideas, and action together and to address some of the most difficult problems facing our communities and our world. Um, programs his administration developed have not only changed how we think about the possibilities of public service, but also created new opportunities for Americans to serve their fellow citizens uh, and to enrich their own lives. And the Clinton Global Initiative now is having an even broader impact, helping find practical solutions to some of our greatest global challenges. Now, uh, in this day of hypercriticism of anyone involved in public service, you might question why enter this particular field at all. Uh, after all, there are a lot of other ways to make a living beyond public service. So I thought I would uh, use myself as the example, or as an example. Uh, and I was a partner at a major law firm in Arizona uh, making a very good living when President Clinton asked me to serve as the United States Attorney for Arizona. Um, and I loved that position. That is a great job. Uh, but after four years, I decided I needed to try my own hand at elective office. And I still remember the day I called my dad uh, to tell him I was resigning as U.S. Attorney to run for Attorney General of Arizona. And there was this kind of moment of stunned silence on the phone. And, he, and then he said, you know, Janet, let me, let me get this straight. You were at a law firm, and you made X. And then you became the US attorney, and you made a salary of about 2 thirds of X. And now you won't earn any money for nine months while you campaign for a job that pays less than 1 half of X. And uh, I told him that he was correct, uh, but that I wasn't worried at all. And he said, why the heck not? And I said, well, that trust fund that he had for me that he hadn't told me about when I was a young child, so I'd grow up to be hardworking and independent, he could, he could share it with me now. It was OK. <laughs> so there was this kind of moment of silence on the phone. Anyway, a couple of days later, I received a check in the mail made out to my campaign account in the amount of five dollars <laughs> and it was signed Napolitano Trust Fund and then he wrote on the little ledger exhaustion of principal and interest <laughs> so <laughs> I still have that check by the way uh, uh, but uh, I have decided and I, as many of you have in this hall this evening or you wouldn't be here uh, that a career in the public service presents its own opportunities and rewards uh, far beyond paychecks. And the benefits go beyond the personal, of course, uh, because to have people who are dedicated, who are educated, 
and who are experienced in the public service is vital in a complex and large democracy such as our own. Uh, now, we know that public servants often don't get the thanks or credit they deserve. Uh, indeed, they often get the opposite. I see that every day at the Department of Homeland Security, uh, where literally hundreds of thousands of people who work for us get up in the morning, they go to work uh, with the idea of uh, keeping people safe, and they go to bed with the idea of keeping people safe, uh, but nonetheless uh, can be the subject of uh, criticism or attempts at late night humor. Uh, but as many of you can appreciate, um, uh, they have within themselves and we have within ourselves uh, the sense of the rewards, the real rewards of public service um, and the ability to see the impact of the work that you're doing firsthand. Uh, you, you do get a sense that what you're doing can make a positive difference or is important or is essential uh, to, the, to the effective functioning of our government. Uh, and you see it in lots of ways, large and small, uh, on a daily basis. Now, um, in a very short time, uh, on two weeks from, from Sunday, Americans and people all over the world uh, will, in their own way, commemorate one of the most tragic events in the history of our nation. Uh, the terrorist attacks on 9-11 were, of course, the reason that the Department of Homeland Security was created, as you heard Senator Pryor say. We were stood up as part of the national security framework created to counter new th threats, uh, including uh, what previously had been inconceivable, the indiscriminate murder of thousands of men and women and children uh, because of an ideology of warped religious and political views. So for many, the anniversary will summon the memories of those days immediately after 9-11, a time of, of grief and anger and sorrow and of loss. And in the weeks and months after 9-11, immediately after 9-11, we saw an outpouring of service, of effort, of compassion by Americans that truly was remarkable. We saw the men and women of the United States Congress, Democrats and Republicans alike, spontaneously sing God Bless America on the steps of the United States Capitol. At Buckingham Palace, they played the Star Spangled Banner. The headline of the French newspaper Le Monde was, We Are All Americans. So it was a very special time of unity. And my purpose here this evening uh, is to possibly help reignite some of that sense of unity, that unity of purpose, but also to redefine it. We need the kind of unity to meet the threats and challenges we face now, ones that have evolved and have evolved even within the last few years. To this end, we need Americans to serve. We need Americans to engage. There is an enormous role for our citizens, for Americans young and old and in the middle, for our communities and our places of worship, for our businesses and the private sector to engage. Uh, and just like those with pioneers in the Peace Corps or AmeriCorps, we have people leading the way now, and we must have them to make America more secure, and we must do it one community at a time, one hometown at a time. And we also, simultaneously must build our resilience. And the resilience means the ability to endure a crisis or a catastrophe and to bounce right back, get right back on the horse, and get right back to work. Now let's discuss today's evolving threats. Over the past year, I've been speaking at colleges and universities across the country about the threats we face today and what I believe our responses to those threats should be. Today's threats uh, differ from those of the recent past. 
Many of them are global in scope and origin. Their potential impact is far greater, and they often target the systems and the infrastructure that underlie global travel and commerce and communication. This means that no single nation can address them alone. Terrorist threats did not begin on 9-11, and nor did they end with the death of Osama bin Laden. Today's threats are real and rapidly changing. They demand our constant vigilance, and they demand our willingness to learn and to adapt. One of the most um, striking elements of today's threat picture is that plots to attack America increasingly involve American citizens and residents, including Americans who may be in the United States and prepared to carry out attacks with little or no warning. And the fact that these new kinds of threats can come from any direction and with little warning changes much of our traditional thinking about terrorism prevention from a decade or even a few years ago. And as a result, we find that our state, our local, tribal, territorial law enforcement officers, our first responders, and individual citizens are often the first to notice signs of potential terrorist activity in their own communities. And that means we need to reach a place where every part of our society is cognizant of the different threats that are out there and are empowered to take common sense steps to help counter them. Even more than that, every element of our society must play a role in how we respond to these threats. And, and they are different. It can be an act of terrorism. It can be threats from cyberspace. Uh, it can be a natural disaster or even a fast-spreading pandemic disease. In a crisis, local communities are the first to feel the impact of an attack or disaster. Individuals are the first ones on the scene. So the more we equip our communities to effectively respond, the better we will be at saving lives and accelerating our recoveries. Now, that means a new direction for public engagement. As we approach the 10th anniversary of 9-11, there's no question but that the United States is stronger and more secure than we were a year ago. We have bounced back from one of the worst attacks ever on our soil. We have made significant progress on virtually every front to protect ourselves. The uh, Department of Homeland Security and our many partners have worked to build a new homeland security, what we call a homeland security enterprise, to better mitigate and defend against dynamic threats, to better enable us to minimize risks, and to better enable us to maximize our ability to respond to and recover from attacks and disasters of all kinds. Now, last month, uh, I released a progress report showing in detail how we have expanded information sharing with a full range of partners, particularly with our state and local partners. How we have strengthened transportation security and the screening for weapons and explosives that could be smuggled onto planes. How we have improved cybersecurity and the protection of critical infrastructure. And how we have bolstered the security at our borders and improved emergency preparedness and response by providing grants and training and exercises to states and cities and communities across this country. Now, these efforts taken together have provided a strong foundation to protect communities from terrorism or other threats while safeguarding the fundamental rights we hold dear. But this is not just a role for government. The educated participation of individual citizens is an important part of what we are doing. 
Today, we don't talk about service, about community, as much as we did following 9-11. You don't hear that same language used, that same spirit evoked. Uh, it's perhaps not surprising. We've settled into more normal rhythms uh, of critique and counter-critique. And perhaps in some ways, that's a good thing. But as we get further from that day 10 years ago, and as we continue to witness threats from individuals and groups who want to use terror to achieve their goals, we need to resharpen our focus on the role for public service. Americans have shown again and again their desire and their capacity to serve. When he came into office, President Obama brought a strong personal commitment to revitalizing that energy that President Clinton sparked with the creation of AmeriCorps. In proclaiming September 11th to be a National Day of Service and Remembrance, President Obama noted that 9-11 is an opportunity to salute the heroes of 9-11, to recapture the spirit of unity and compassion that inspired our nation following the attacks, and to rededicate ourselves to sustain service to our communities. In our network world, new threats exploit technology in ways that make foolproof protections virtually impossible. But we should react to these emerging realities with confidence, with resilience, and foresight, and not with fear. As we've been saying at the Department of Homeland Security, we are building our homeland security by building our hometown security. And we do it one hometown at a time. So, how do you do that? First, we do it together with federal partners like this department working with local communities, local law enforcement, local leaders, local first responders. Over the last 10 years, we have brought resources and expertise to our state and local partners and communities and built new mechanisms to share information with each other, to train together, to work together, and to respond to emergencies together. Uh, we've done this, for example, by supporting the creation of state and local fusion centers, now in 72 states and locales. Fusion centers are the label we give to centers that enable the sharing of information at all levels of government, among law enforcement, first responders, and intelligence professionals to give any community the best possible picture of threats or dangers to it at any precise moment in time. We've also greatly expanded and enhanced what's called the National Suspicious Activity Reporting Initiative, or SAR. Now, that's a somewhat ominous sounding name, reporting suspicious activity. But what it is, is a training for state and local law enforcement to recognize behaviors and indicators related to terrorism, crime, and other threats, and to standardize how those observations can be documented, analyzed, and shared with other people in the intelligence and law enforcement communities. We also launched the new National Terrorism Advisory System in April of this past year, replacing the outdated color Thank you. The NTAS replaces the old color code. Remember the color code? Every day it was orange. Orange is gone. Uh, but what it's replaced with is something that reflects what I've been suggesting to you this evening, that every person has a role and that you must play that role, to play that role, you have to have information. So the National Terrorism Advisory System says this, look, we, we operate every day on a level of elevated risk because we don't think risk has gone away or will go away in the foreseeable future. But if we have specific or credible information about a particular risk, we will raise that advisory system 
Uh, and we will tell you what the risk is. We will share as many facts as we can. We will share with you what you need to do to protect yourself and your families. And we will give you several options on how to keep current with accurate information as a crisis rolls along. The new National Terrorism Advisory System. We have not to date um, raised uh, the level uh, uh, for that system, but it's all designed to give individuals information so that we live empowered and not in fear, so that we know what to do, not just what not to do. Um, and in addition to the above, uh, and really emphasizing the role each person in this room plays and each person outside plays, uh, we've, we've enlarged a campaign based on one that had been in New York, uh, and it's called, uh, very simply, See Something, Say Something. Uh, right? If you see something, say something. It's a simple and effective way to emphasize the importance of reporting suspicious activity to proper authorities. And look at a few examples of what happens when people do that. Um, it was, after all, a street vendor who tipped off police to the attempted Times Square bombing in 2010 and probably prevented um, hundreds of deaths or serious injury. In January of this year, alert city workers in Spokane, Washington, reported a suspicious backpack, and in doing so, thwarted what was almost certainly a deadly bombing along the Martin Luther King Parade route. Uh, and in recent weeks, an alert store owner brought information forward to authorities that likely prevented attempted violence and in Fort Hood, Texas. See something, say something. So that's the first approach. We're in this together, everybody has a role. Um, and second, we communicate with and learn from each other. Uh, we have a lot at the federal level to learn from our state and local partners and from communities and from you, the public. Uh, we have more than 240,000 employees at the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, but the vast majority of them, uh, about 90 percent, actually do not work in Washington, D.C. They are working with local partners in communities like Little Rock throughout the country and indeed in some 75 countries around the world. And to tell some of their remarkable stories of dedication and service, uh, we've created something for this year called Heroes on the Front Lines, um, which you can see at our site, dhs.gov. I'll say that again before the end of the talk this evening. But among those ranks are heroes like Raymond Rivera, a Border Patrol agent now stationed in Amado, Arizona, uh, where he inspects vehicles with his canine, Zara. Uh, during his service, Agent Rivera risked his life as part of an operation to disrupt human trafficking rings in Nogales acting as an undercover agent to arrange the purchase and delivery of illegal Iranian passports and making arrangements to smuggle Iranian nationals into the United States via Mexico. His actions led to more than two dozen prosecutions and broke up that travel route. Um, or consider uh, Nori Larbi, a TSA representative uh, for the Middle East and North Africa. On October 29th of this past year, the United States and our allies disrupted an attempt to conceal and ship explosive devices on board aircraft bound for the United States. They were hidden in toner cartridges, printer toner cartridges. Nori was part of the team that assisted the Yemeni government in strengthening air cargo security operations following the attempted attack. So the same thing could not be attempted again. And then there's Sidney Melton, who is a public assistance infrastructure director in the Florida recovery of FEMA. Uh, last May, he arrived in Hackleburg, Alabama, after an EF-5 tornado destroyed most of that community. The tornado was one of 64 that impacted Alabama last spring, killing 241 people. Over two months, Sydney assisted with the recovery efforts working long hours to help those communities start to recover. He's also an Army veteran, one of nearly 50,000 veterans we have working at the Department of Homeland Security who are, continuing to con who are continuing with their service 
to our nation. So people getting involved, communicating with each other. The third way we build our hometown security is by building on what works. Uh, for instance, we know that preparedness for a natural disaster like a hurricane or a wildfire saves lives, and we can build on what we've learned to help communities prepare for that or any other kind of crisis. And indeed, right now, we are uh, preparing as Hurricane Irene uh, begins its route, and we begin to analyze if, when, and where uh, it will strike the United States this year, uh, in the next few days, actually. Uh, we also know uh, that community-oriented policing strategies have had major impacts on reducing violent crime related to drug and gang activity. So now we are working with frontline police officers all around the country to adapt that knowledge for use against the evolving threat posed by homegrown violent extremists. In other words, what worked then, we believe, can work now in helping us counter a different threat, but still a threat to the safety and security of our communities. Uh, and um, that's why we also know and want to continue uh, to make sure uh, that our communities are prepared and resilient and stand a better chance of recovery and rebuilding after any type of disaster. Getting all of the community involved, why? Because it benefits all of us. It can be learning to assist law enforcement or, force, or first responders in an emergency being a force multiplier for efforts and another set of eyes and ears. It can be as a small business owner lending his or her expertise to other businesses that survive a disaster and need help getting operations back up and running. It can be an individual, say, in the cybersecurity field helping to build stronger firewalls or design more resilient software and networks to shield our critical information systems from intrusion or attacks. Indeed, um, people with experience and expertise across a full range of fields and professions should be and can be working and connecting ahead of time to be ready to step in and to support response and recovery in their communities, in their states, and indeed in the country. So in other words, public service in support of our security is broader than, say, going to work for the government. It's actually part of our citizens, our joint commitment to each other, that we are all in this together. This is the philosophy underlying what we're doing. It's the philosophy underlying things like Citizen Corps. It's the, it's the philosophy under, underlying things like local CERT programs and the Red Cross and others of our partner organizations. CERT, by the way, stands for Community Emergency Response Teams. Now, these are all volunteer groups of community members who've been trained in basic disaster response, such as fire safety and search and rescue. And by the way, we've been putting those CERT teams to good use this past spring. Uh, they give their time, their energy in the classroom, through training, through exercises, to help communities be more prepared as citizens, as citizens all in this together recognizing that public service can be for the government, but should never be restricted to the government. It is much, much more. So at the national level, the challenge for us is to pivot from the old view of seeing the public and the private sector as liabilities to be protected. Instead, the public and the private sector are active partners and can be powerful assets to prevent, to prepare, and when called upon, to respond and to rebuild. Communities that are more prepared and more resilient not only stand the best chance of bouncing back after a disaster, they free up our first responders, our emergency personnel to focus on those who need help the most. Our tradition of banding together to prepare for tough conditions or respond to a crisis runs deep in our country. More than a century and a half ago, perceptive visitors, like Alex de Tocqueville from France, wrote with astonishment 
about the civic mindedness in America, a nation founded on ideals. He wrote, Americans of all ages, all stations in life, and all types of dispositions are forever forming associations, recognizing we're all in this together. Uh, and uh, we involved our citizens more formally in preparedness and national defense when we established the country's first civilian defense office in 1916. During World War II, when our economy was mobilized for war, the American people found a way to feed themselves by growing 40% of our vegetables needed in 20 million victory gardens. And in the early years of the Cold War, Americans knew where the closest fallout shelter was, but they also knew to keep their children indoors when polio outbreaks were the biggest threat to public health. But uh, we're past that history now. We need new thinking. We need new energy. We need the active participation of our society that has helped our nation get through some of its toughest times in the past. In those times, we understood what was at stake. We understood that we have to contribute. We understood that our efforts make a difference in ways large and small. And we saw that same spirit of contribution and service after the attacks of 9-11. And today, almost 10 years later, I believe we can, we will find that spirit again. So I want to thank you for being here tonight, for being involved in these and other efforts, for helping champion the cause of the kind of public service we need today, and by doing so, helping define the safety and security of our country for the future. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you, Madam Secretary. We're now going to take some questions. Would you please raise your hand? Uh, and then we'll let the microphone come to you. So if anyone has a question, let's, uh, let's have at it. We have a question right here, and here is the microphone coming at you. Hold your hand up, please. Till... Is it possible for them to, to construct a uh, dirty bomb in the United States? Is it possible to construct a terrorists to do that? Um, there are a variety of ways um, by which such a device uh, can be uh, constructed. Uh, and for those who have the right kind of expertise, uh, there is that possibility. It's one of the reasons we uh, constantly practice or have constantly practiced uh, what to do if such a device were actually to be successfully detonated. Uh, say, in uh, downtown Manhattan, uh, and what re requirements we would have, what kind of medical capabilities would have to be surged, uh, and uh, how, how that whole problem would be dealt with. It's a, you know, you, 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 it's an example of why it's going to take all of us, because some of these things can indeed have impacts uh, that are quite significant. But if we respond in the right way, uh, and with the right skill set and the right people properly trained and ready ahead of time, we can find the damage. I'm sorry. Yeah, we got a question right here, Fernando. Uh, thank you, Madam Secretary. Thank you very much for coming out here. My name is Fernando Coots. I'm a student at the Clinton School. And on behalf of all of us, you know, we're very honored to have you. So thank you for being out here. Uh, my question is. Um, I think that many people, most Americans, associate your department with September 11th and foreign terrorism and trying to fight that off. Uh, but as you talked about today, there are several other things that you are focused on and that are very important to America, such as uh, fighting off natural disasters and reacting to them, cyber warfare, uh, and even um, things like the COPS grant uh, that is being cut uh, currently by Congress, or even our own internal budget. Uh, in your opinion, what makes you the most worried about, let's say, or what keeps you up at night as far as uh, security of our ha homeland goes? What keeps me up at night? Um, 
You know, I'll tell you, uh, the things you know about, you can prepare for and think through how to respond. Um, but uh, you, there's no way to know everything. Uh, you can't know every plot. You can't know everything that Mother Nature has uh, coming uh, up. Uh, there's just no way to do it. And so uh, I, what, I, what you worry most about is what you don't know. And what you have to understand is, look, there are no guarantees. We can't seal the country off from any possible way that somebody could get in and commit another attack. We can maximize our ability uh, to prevent them from being successful. We can put into place multiple layers. We can uh, minimize their impact by being able to respond quickly and effect effectively. But we don't live in a world of guarantees. Uh, we live in a world where we have risk. Um, and to the extent that you know, I have intelligence or information, I know things are out there, uh, then we know that we can deal with them. But you always know in the back of your head there's, there's something that you don't know. Uh, and then you have to have the confidence in yourself that if that is to actually happen, if a risk is actually to materialize or take effect, uh, you have to have the confidence in yourself that um, you'll, you'll rise to that occasion and deal with that one too. We have a question right over here, Bill. A um, couple light questions and then a heavy question. Do you fly commercially? I, I do not. Okay, I, so I, I, I don't need to ask the second question about the shoes. Uh, well, you can. Uh, uh, if uh, you don't fly commercially, then you don't have to take off your shoes. I have to uh, actually, um, uh, I did fly commercial as governor of Arizona. The 9-11 Act actually um, has some restrictions on what the Secretary of Homeland Security can fly. And it means I have to be near secure communications at all times. However, uh, everybody I know has their uh, flight uh, issue. One of the things that we are looking at and we are moving toward in the TSA is not uh, uh, treating all passengers uh, as if they were all high-risk passengers, uh, but beginning to make some common sense differentiations. And I believe over the, over the coming months that will enable us uh, to take some of the pressure off of the traveling environment. That is our hope. And on the heavy side, um, 2008, a uh, threat was brewing and it popped up as these derivatives that have cost uh, many people uh, who are living right now, they're not dead, they have to survive. But the financial crisis that took place, do you see that as a a threat that your department would be um, thinking about? Well, I think we, look, um, uh, public service doesn't, doesn't mean, and, and government service doesn't mean you, you get a, a, you know, a, not a, a checkbook that has any, any amount in it. You have a responsibility to be a good steward with the dollars you get, to put them where they'll do the most good, and uh, you have to make choices. Um, and uh, now, just as we did then, um, uh, we, we are in the process of uh, making some of those choices. Um, but it's also a further illustration of uh, what I'm suggesting this evening, which is to say, uh, look, we're not, we're not going to have in, in the government uh, all of the resources for every possible risk, but there's such a force multiplier of individuals and local communities and nonprofits and and the faith-based community and everyone uh, joins hands in a much closer way perhaps than we have before. That's part of fiscal responsibility as well. Question right over here, right up the front here. Thank you for coming this evening. I'm a nursing faculty here in Little Rock, but I'm also a Red Cross nurse, and I'm working with the National Red Cross to develop strategies to educate nursing students all over the country to respond in Red Cross disaster shelters. But another mission I've been on lately is to get people prepared at the individual and family level. You talked about communities, but we need to have everyone make a plan and build a kit so that while they're waiting for FEMA or the state to come, they can take care of themselves for at least a few right. days. Right. Listen, um, and, and if the media will put this on, help me out, uh, dhs.gov uh, or fema.gov. You can click right on what we ask uh, all families to do to be prepared. Um, and here's the reason. First of all, 
Um, uh, if there's anything beyond an impending hurricane that should suggest to you that perhaps you ought to revisit your prior plans, I don't know what that is. Um, but we're now in the middle of hurricane season, and we have, uh, had, have one now that looks like it could possibly make landfall in the United States. But beyond that, uh, uh, to the extent people are prepared, uh, they know how their family's going to get back together. They have basic first aid uh, uh, instruction and know how to deal with it. To the extent that you know, they've covered some of those things so that in the event of a disaster, we can focus the government, per se, on those who need help the most, uh, uh, the very elderly, those who have special needs, uh, those who may be trapped someplace that can't get out. Um, that takes the pressure off of us. We can focus on that, those populations um, while, while everybody else is, is you know, coming out, surviving. Uh, showing their own uh, responsibility and, and resilience. And so, uh, again, it's part of all being in this together. And we ask everybody, uh, it's a simple thing, it seems very uh, straightforward, but it's amazing. Uh, you know, in a busy life, things just go by the wayside. This should not. This should not. Yes, we have a question right here, please. I think in, in uh, some of the most more recent um, tragedies, there has been, there have been some issues of local governance and who's in charge. To what extent do you encourage local communities to have a plan in place or are we required to report to you or is it strictly all about local governance that, that there is some sort of a submission of a plan that the people who are to be in charge know they're in charge and there's not this sort of gamesmanship about who gets credit and or people simply not knowing um, which ego should prevail. <laughs> um, here's, here's the way I think it should work. Um, uh, in, in most uh, uh, disasters, um, it will be that the local community will have the first response. Um, they have the police, they have the health care facility, uh, they have the immediate chapter of the Red Cross, for example, uh, they should have the immediate network of faith-based or other institutions that can help with shelter and the like. Uh, the, the state comes in to help local communities in that regard. And we come in uh, when a disaster is of such a, a level that the, the local authority is just overwhelmed. It doesn't have the resources or um, it just simply needs more uh, than it has on hand. And so. Uh, uh, a clear illustration of this is, is FEMA. FEMA is not a first responder. Um, uh, FEMA is uh, to come uh, is part of a team uh, that should come to su supplement, to complement what the, the local uh, in the state uh, authorities already have done, and uh, to make sure that we make available throughout the country training, education, exercise opportunities so people know what they're supposed to do. Um, and, and no, we don't um, require everybody to submit a plan for us to fly spec. Um, we don't have enough time for that. Um, um, but what we do ask is that communities be working amongst themselves so they know that they themselves are prepared uh, and know what to do. I want to thank uh, the Compuris family for this wonderful lecture series. I thank you.